Hello and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. I'm your host and Master Gardener in Training, Tanisha Shades Bain. We've got some great questions, topics, and of course, some show and tells to get to tonight. So we're just gonna jump right in. On the show, we've got a wonderful panel of experts, as always, who are ready to share their knowledge with us about all things gardening. So if you would all please introduce yourselves. We'll start down with you, Chuck, and just give us a little bit more about your expertise. Okay, I am Chuck Voigt, and I was a vegetable and herb specialist at the University of Illinois for 27 years and I've been retired a little over two. So vegetables, herbs, and a little general horticulture. So, but vegetables and herbs would be uh, probably my main area. Great, okay, Jennifer. I am Jennifer Nelson. I'm a horticulturalist. I write a blog called Grounded and Growing and my favorite topics are houseplants, uh, vegetables, and general horticulture. Wonderful. And I'm John Bodenstein, I'm a Vermilion County uh, Master Gardener. Uh, my expertise uh, is hostas, perennials, tomatoes. I have uh, just about anything green I, that I, I, in my yard I enjoy, so um, I like all, all the plants. Wonderful, wonderful. And everybody brought something to share tonight. So Chuck, we'll start down with you. Okay. Uh, what did you bring? Well, I was looking for something that I don't have at home so that I can enjoy eating this when I go home. <laughs> there you um, go. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you've never seen this before, it is Florence fennel, sometimes called finocchio, if you're, if you're of Italian derivation. Um, there's several varieties of this. Uh, within fennel, the, there are some that don't make this, this enlarged part of the petioles here at the base. Sometimes it's called a bulb. Technically, it's really not a bulb, but if, if, if that floats your boat, it's okay. <laughs> um, it's great stuff, uh, kind of a, just a light licorice kind of a flavor. Uh, goes really well with, with <coughs> fish mm -hmm. particularly, but some other things. It's not overpowering. Um, fennel seed is what mm -hmm. makes Italian sausage have that, that kind of a licorice aftertaste, is the fennel seed. So if you're ever wanting Italian sausage and you just have like your basic I won't, I'm trying not to say Jimmy Dean, but it's not going to work. <laughs> just your basic, basic whole hog pork stock. So just, just uh, crush some some fennel seeds, work it into that, let it sit overnight in the refrigerator, and then you'll have that mm -hmm. that that nice mm. licorice overtone to it. Um, works works really well. All, basically, all parts of this are edible. You know, so you could use some of the fine leaves in a salad, and you could you know, do this as a as a vegetable. Sometimes I've seen it, you know, kind of topped, and then steamed mm -hmm. and then it's kind of spread out in sort of like a fan mm -hmm. on, on a plate if you go some 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 uh, fairly upscale restaurant but just really nice i think if you can get it to come up and not get burned by the hot sun i think you can still maybe not get this size in it but i think you could still grow these this fall Wonderful. but uh you have to do something to keep them from mm -hmm. from just coming up and then burning off because yeah, it's easy to, to plant them with a little water and get them to come up but then the sun shines down, the soil surface gets to be 130, 140 degrees, and that's not too, not too conducive <laughs> to plant growth. Now, what are, what are some of the flavors that people can expect? You said most of it or all of it's edible. What kind of variations can you expect from well, different parts? Well, they, they, they even use the roots. And, wow. and, and all of them have varying degrees of that, of that kind of a, a, a licorice -y, uh, undertone. Um, uh, it might be more concentrated in the roots and maybe in the foliage. Uh, this the 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 petioles here are are incredibly mild. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay, great. Thank you so much for sharing. All right. Next show and tell, Jen. What'd you bring? Next, I brought. Uh, this is called the lifesaver plant. It's Wernia zebrina, and it is a succulent. And it has a really cool flower that managed to die this afternoon before I brought it here. <laughs> but I, I, you know, living things don't always cooperate. Uh, but I don't do a darn thing to it and it flowers like crazy. Mm. I've had it for about four years. It's a great plant if you're really a busy person. It m spends most of the year in my bathroom window and there's a picture of the flower. It Ooh. looks like a plastic or a real a wild cherry lifesaver. It does. And the flowers last for several days and once they're done they just kind of dry up into nothing. Mm. So you don't even really have anything to deadhead or clean up and it just it's very happy to exist in my bathroom window and look like like it has no care in the world. So, so for someone who forgets to water, perfect, or, you know that kind of thing. Much better for the person that forgets to water than the person that waters all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but definitely one I would recommend. Wonderful. Okay. All right. And 
What did you bring, John? I brought something that I think is way underused in our gardens. Uh, this is called ground cherry. It's, it's the variety is Aunt Molly's. And I've grown it since I was 10 or 11 uh, on the farm up in North Dakota. We, and it, these little candles uh, tend to, they drop off um, and um, like that. They'll fall to the ground and turn, they turn brown, they dry up. And then once they're on the, brown, on the ground, you just squeeze the end and pop and this is what it, it, is. it looks like. And it makes a wonderful sauce for over ice cream, especially vanilla ice cream, mm -hmm. over pancakes. And this is what it ends up looking like. Um, it's a, a, a very nice sauce, it's sweet. Uh, one nice thing, if you don't pick all the, the uh, little uh, cherries up, uh, they tend to reseed, so then you don't have to buy seeds the following year. And uh, it's um, just one of those things that I, I grew up with and I found a pack of seeds, I got them to grow and, and, and I've been canning and, and processing. I, I think I canned uh, 20 half pints uh, day wow. before yesterday and about 20 quarter pints. So, wow. so it, uh, it's very prolific as you can see. There's lots, and this is just one branch that was growing into my into the lawn, so I decided to cut it off <laughs> and uh, bring it to show. But Aunt Molly's and ground cherry, and uh, is this a native plant to Illinois? That I do not know. I don't think so. Okay. It's a, it's a seed. Uh, this is the first I've ever seen uh, it, so yeah. that's why I asked. There's a weed that's that's yes. very similar, but I don't I don't think it's the same species. Yeah. You no. just gave me and some homework. Not, and some <laughs> people call it a. Um, husk tomato, but it's not in the tomato family at all. Hmm. And uh, it, uh, it's just one of those unique plants that's uh, fun to grow and it's even more fun to eat. I can't wait to try the sauce that you made. <laughs> and it does spread out as you It see. spreads, it only gets about 18 inches high, but it gets to be about four feet across really. Wow. And uh, it's, uh, and then you have to look underneath it and find uh, all the little cherries that are on the ground. Hmm. and. Uh, it doesn't take long and you end up with a, a big basket and then you just, uh, what I did is just make a simple syrup and put the cherries in there until they burst and then you process them, can them yeah, and process when them. When you get a ripe one and, and, and husk oh. it, it's kind of a nice honey uh, yeah. it's, fragrance. Yeah. It's, oh. it's hmm. very sweet and it's a very unique taste. Huh. So. Hmm. Awesome, okay. Thank you very much. All right, and uh, real quick, <coughs> we just wanna let you know that the new episode is up from our podcast. Um, you can get that from our website or via Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and the NPR One app. Victoria's guest this week was University of Illinois horticulture educator Kelly Alsop, and they talked about butterflies and bugs. Plenty of those <laughs> right now. Okay, so now we're going to move into viewer call-ins. Let's start with line two. Anne in Champaign, she has a question about hydrangeas. Anne, are you there? Yes. Hi, what's your question? I have a blue endless summer hydrangea, five years old, bloomed beautifully for two years and hasn't bloomed the last three. Lovely plant, rounded, never folds over, beautiful leaves, no bloom. Yeah, we, we hear that a lot. Well, it's actually um, kind of in the emails coming up, it but is. I can tell you that um, it's not uncommon with endless summer to have that happen, and that is one of the newer hydrangeas that blooms both on new and old wood. And even though it will bloom on new wood, the blooms usually show up later, um, maybe as late as August or even September. But stay tuned, and we're going to be talking more about mm -hmm. hydrangeas when we get into some viewer mail. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much for calling. Thank you. All right, let's go to three. We've got Mary with a question about sandy stone and algae. Mary, are you there? Yeah. Hi, what's your question? Uh, we just recently purchased some new property down in Calhoun County, and it's mostly sandy and uh, a little bit of clay in the soil. And so a lot of our garden turned out real well, like the watermelon and pumpkins, but some of the other vegetables just didn't grow well. And I was wondering if we put red clover in there and tilled it up next spring, if that would help them in the soil a little bit. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, definitely. Yeah. I yeah. think anything, you know, a compost, anything that you can work into sandy soil mm -hmm. is going to be great for the other things. Now, the watermelon and, and gourds and that thing, type of thing probably did real well in sandy soil, but other things need a little bit more um, stable moisture holding type than, than what your sand is going to do. So. Um, the red clover, winter rye, winter rye, any, um, any, any, even if you just buy uh, already made compost and work mm -hmm. that in, uh, composted manure would be give it some nutrients and um, shredded leaves. Yeah, yeah, those, those will be free here pretty <laughs> soon. Yeah. Yeah, I hate, I hate to see forty bags of those right. sitting at the end of somebody's yes. driveway just to get hauled away. Till them in your garden. Yeah, the, the other thing is if you have crops in there that you're not taking out until the end of summer. Uh, oats works really well yes. okay. because it makes a really good growth in the fall and it doesn't survive the winter. I don't think it will in, in Calhoun County. Uh, and then it's it's already starting to break down by spring, but it's it's taken up a lot of nutrients mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. give you a lot of organic matter. And it's not as hard to kill as say a winter rye, mm -hmm. which can be a bit of a bear to kill in the spring unless you- you got to get out and, on it right unless, away. <laughs> unless you're really into Roundup or something that mm -hmm. gives you a little help. Some of those like the oats, you know, it grows and, and pulls the nutrients out of the soil and then holds it in there. And then as it breaks down, it slowly releases mm -hmm. it. So you get a natural fertilizer for mm -hmm. it. But basically, any amount of organic matter you can get worked into that is going to be a good thing. Yeah, as the more the you, better. As long as you stay away from things like sawdust and things that, right. that don't have any nitrogen in them and are going to give you problems. Yeah. Just any anything that's that'll break down quickly mm -hmm. and, and not soak up a lot of nitrogen is is going to help you a lot because it, it's not going to take away the fact mm -hmm. that melons grow well in the sandy soil, right. but it's going to help you with everything mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. All right, we're going to go to Jared. He's on five with a question about pumpkins. Jared, are you there? Yes, uh, my fiance uh, wanted to buy some uh, seeds for giant pumpkins. And I'm like, okay, well, I planted them in some extremely rich compost, and they just took right off, but they fed on yellow. I thought, uh oh, some of them fell off, but the ones that are still hanging on are yellow, and they're growing at a exponential rate. <laughs> and I'm just wondering if they've got a bright yellow flesh, lemon colored, almost lemon shaped. They've got a big belly button where the uh, where the blossom was, bright yellow stem. I'm just wondering what the heck have I got growing here? Well, that's just the, they're they're immature. Um, a lot of the giant well. Some of the older giant pumpkins would come in green and pink and all sorts of different mm -hmm, shades, mm -hmm. but most of them now will eventually turn orange as as they get to maturity. But they're they're like immature yellow. So uh, as they get bigger and start to mature, you should get more of what you think of as a pumpkin color. Um, so so don't despair. Um, and if if ultimately in another year you want to get the very biggest ones you can. You might want to take off the first female blossoms, let it get lots and lots of foliage, and then choose one female blossom that gets mm -hmm. pollinated and keep all the rest of them off of it so that the whole vine and all the leaves are feeding that mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. pumpkin. Sure. And that's, that's the way you can, you can start to get uh, a fairly large pumpkin. Uh, you know, the giants that are over a ton, uh, you're kind of looking at, <laughs> they have very special genetics that they charge an arm and a leg to, to get a seed from some of those, and that's fine. Uh, so start small. If you can get to a couple hundred pounds, you've done a, a pretty good job. Wow. Yeah. Make sure you keep it watered. Yes. If, if um, the, this whole idea of growing giant pumpkins intrigues you, there's a documentary called Lords of the Gourd. <laughs> that is, that would be, a, would be a nice thing to watch this winter, and just <laughs> there's a niche for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. To line six now, Elizabeth in Champaign has a question about pine trees. Elizabeth, are you there? Yes. Hello, go ahead. Um, um, I'm calling about my favorite big pine tree. I don't know what it is. It has the soft uh, needles and it's over 50 feet. And it suddenly... Yes, I am. Um, I'm, I'm calling about my big pine tree, which has been so beautiful to see for over 30 years, and, and it's over 50 feet, and now it's turning yellow and brown, and I don't know what to do. 
Ah, okay. So it's over 50 hmm. feet. How, do you know about how old it is? Sorry? Do you know about how old it is? Well, I've been here for 35 years, and it was okay. this. It was growing. It wasn't as big as it is now. So mature. Is it a blue spruce-like? Uh, I don't know the name of it, but it has the long, soft uh, pines. And, okay, soft needles. Um, oh, soft needles. And it usually has lots of uh, uh, acorns. And, I mean, pine cones? I don't know what's gone wrong. It suddenly became yellow and brown. Has there been any construction or anybody digging around the, the tree lately? No. Is are we getting to the part of the year where they they shed the old needles? More like the October. -y. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I've been yeah that usually happens, you know. But right now it's just and it's just suddenly last maybe in the last one week when I suddenly saw the tree it was changing yellow and now it's brown and and the brown is all the way some of it to the top. Hmm. Yeah, well, we you know pine trees evergreens have had a real difficult time lately the last three four years because of you know we've had real wet periods and real dry periods real wet periods and then mm -hmm. and then we've had hard winters and pines uh, uh, spruces have have really suffered and if you go if you're traveling on interstate 74 you can see all kinds of dead ones already but it's probably more you know if <clears throat> right now the ground is really dry and most of your evergreens are fairly shallow rooted, right. and so it may just need to, may have needed some water. Some it it's hard to say. What you might do is take a cutting and take it to the extension office. Mm -hmm. Just make sure that you don't have a disease. Um, if it ha if it happens to be an Austrian pine, they're really really susceptible to pine wilt, okay. right? Which is a nematode, and uh, that's if that's the case, it it. It's fatal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but white pines are usually usually almost Im immune to that. They get other things, but mm -hmm. not that. Yeah. But I would I would say bring a sample to the extension office. Let them look at it. Um, but and 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 the uh, graphic is there on on the screen so that you can uh, uh, call them and uh, and find out what they need from you. So. Yep. You can always take a sample to the plant clinic too if that's closer than your extension yeah. office. Okay, line two, Bob in Danville, deadheading plants. Bob, are you there? Yes, I am. Go ahead with your question. Now, th this is Bob in Danville, and I'm calling about deadheading flowers. Uh, my wife says get out and deadhead that flower because of the bloom has dropped off. And uh, I don't know where to deadhead them or when to deadhead them. Would you wait till it totally dries up and cut them down near the base of the plant, or you cut them near where the flower fell off? So. Uh, primarily talking about uh, roses, geraniums, and petunias are my favorite. Okay, petunias are one of those strange ones that once, the, even though the flower falls off, you'll see that little star where the flower was, and you need to cut that off because the plant senses that and thinks that there's it's producing seeds, mm -hmm. and that you doesn't have to produce any more flowers. And so if you cut those all off, I know it's going to take some time because some of them have hundreds and hundreds of, but I've done it with mine this year, and it's amazing how much difference it makes. Takes a lot of time, um, and but just take a little scissors, a little snipper, and sometime when you're just sitting outside, just put it on your lap and start cutting those little stars off and you need to get back to the <laughs> to the, the to the stem just don't nip that little the, the little fringes off you need to cut that whole part where the pet where the seed where the plant thinks the seeds are uh, and uh, cut that off other plants he mentioned roses roses uh, if you you know if you go back to the Fifth leaf, uh, you can usually get better, yes, larger. It's, it's like the, the first, the first, the first compound leaf yeah. that mm -hmm. you see. Cut it back just above that, and that usually brings them back on. Mm -hmm. the, the exception would be if, if it's like one that you want to have rose hips on, right? And then you right. would let them go ahead and mature if it was a rugosa or something. Yeah. And then geranium, you would just go to follow the stem of the flower down to where it meets the main yeah, stem, and it comes right off. It's, yeah, usually they, right off. usually they almost. Uh, they almost do it themselves. They almost do it, them, when almost do it themselves. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. But petunias are one of those that. If you get behind that petunias, you can just grab a handful of foliage and just whack it back. And just whack, whack them back. back and 
<laughs> Whatever makes the missus happy. Yes. That's Get right. Get those flowers dead. <laughs> Keep your wife but happy. But don't whack it back too much or that, w that won't make her happy. <laughs> happy wife, happy life, right? That's right. <laughs> All right, going to Jan in Bloomington. She has a question about ground cherries. I do. They Go ahead. Are, ground cherries are wonderful. And uh, you talk about uh, the uh, sauce, but have you ever had open face? ground cherry pie oh yes that that's also just it, yeah it's uh it's you can't even, even talk better. about yeah, it it's, <laughs> somebody's mouth back is in watering his ears. So no, bad. No, my mouth is watering right now <laughs> are you did we lose her? Oh, I guess we lost her. Okay, real quick Instagram promo. Uh, we are on Instagram. You can find us by searching Nin American Gardener. Just another way to reach out with us and be connected. Okay, so let's go into another round of questions. And Chuck, this one came in specifically for you. It says, hey Chuck, how do I grow large onions in Northern Illinois? Well, that's, I think that's a good question. Um, the, 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 Number one thing is you have to get the right onion variety. You need a long day onion for Northern Illinois or even here in Central Illinois. Um, so don't look at uh, Texas 1015s or Bermudas or any of those kinds of things because they're not gonna get big here because they get the, the cue to, to make a bulb mm -hmm. when, when they're not big enough. <clears throat> those are for Georgia and Texas and Maui and other places. Um, so something like a, a sweet Spanish onion will get pretty big. If, if you're into great big, then you want to do like uh, uh, Elsa Craig or uh, uh, Kelsey Giant if you can find it. Uh, to grow those, you're probably, you may have to buy seeds and start your own, which you'd have to do in, in uh, about January so that they're ready to go out in late March, early April when the soil gets ready. Um, give them plenty of space if you want big onions. So get the right variety. Maybe start your own to get that variety. Uh, give them plenty of space. You know, if you want an onion this big, they need to be that far apart. Uh, keep the weeds away from them. Um, don't overwater them, but never let them dry out too much. Mm -hmm. And uh, leave them out there till the tops go over. The, the one thing about sweet onions like Kelsey and, and, and Ailsa Craig is that they are very sweet and sweet onions don't keep well. So, okay. Um, you know, impress your friends and, and make <laughs> and a lot of them. onion rings and, and <laughs> move on. Okay. All right. Jen, this one's for you about hydrangeas. How can I make my hydrangeas bloom again? They've bloomed for a couple of years after I moved into my house, but haven't bloomed in about six. Oh, if I had a, a dollar for every time we had a hydrangea <laughs> question, and we had one earlier in the show. Um, Hydrangeas not blooming can be summarized in a problem of excess. So either too much cold, too much shade, or too much nitrogen. So some of the older varieties of hydrangea, especially the macrophylla, the big mop head ones that get our attention in the spring, those are the ones people talk about switching from pink to blue. Mm -hmm. And that's usually why people want to grow it because they're like, ooh, I can change the color mm -hmm. of it, right? <laughs> uh, the older varieties especially would only bloom on old wood. So a hard winter like we just came from last year kills all the stems that are above ground and it's growing up from the base and that's all new wood and it's not going to flower. But even some of the newer ones like the Endless Summer series that is supposed to bloom on new and old wood, sometimes those new wood blooms don't show up till later in the summer. So you might just need to be patient. Um, too much shade, uh, they like sun. All hydrangeas like sun. They don't want to burn up in the afternoon sun mm -hmm. but they need a good session of morning sun. So if trees have grown while you've been in your house. You might have more shade than you started out with. Um, also, too much nitrogen will promote all that leafy growth and not mm -hmm. flowers. So if you're fertilizing a lot, you might want to back off on it. Um, you might want to think about changing what varieties you're growing. If you're growing the big mop head varieties and you're not having good luck with it, think about um, arborescence, which is what my mom used to call snowball bushes. They die all mm -hmm. the way back to the ground. So like okay. Annabelle, I think is one of them. Uh, it was developed here. At the yeah, it was developed here at the University yeah. of Illinois. Uh, paniculata grows on new wood, um, and it's really reliable. And Quercfolia, which is the oak leaf hydrangea, blooms on old wood, but it doesn't seem to be as susceptible to winter kill. 
Um, so another more reliable one. So maybe, yeah. or and then all else fails, just wait. I had some endless summers that just wouldn't bloom, and I just was patient, and they bloomed until they did. They, they didn't until they did. They seem to be about as <laughs> about being dry as any mm -hmm. any hydrangea I've ever seen. Yeah. Okay. John. I've had better luck with my hydrangeas this year than any year. Huh. That I've had them. Just so. at your house, yeah. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna test your speed here. Last question okay. of the night. Here we go. I have two hostas that are turning brown and look like they're dying. How can they be saved? Okay, I, 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 these are your pictures, and I look just looking at them. I don't believe you have a disease. I think it's probably a lack of water. It could be too much sun, but looking at the blue hostas that are at the corners, they still are blue, so I don't think that that's the case, that they're getting too much sun. I think it's just that they're not getting enough um, uh, water. Uh, we've had dry periods, wet periods, so the, the, the roots kind of die back. Uh, I don't think you have petiole rot or crown root rot. Uh, hosta virus X you don't have. Just looking at your picture, I can tell that that's not that. So if you had those diseases, the only way to cure that is to dig them up and throw them away. Uh, if you want some more <laughs> reference, <laughs> there's a book that uh, tells you there are 7,400 Haas is listed here for this, this winter, three years old, and so I think there's a thousand more ready that they've Yikes. they've come up with. <laughs> but uh, I think it just okay. needs some steady, good watering, just from just from. So the, don't give up on it yet. No, don't give up that's on it. Give, give it some good watering. Okay. All right. Man, that goes so fast. Unfortunately, that's all the time we've got for this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for our callers who called in and all of the emails and questions that you sent in. Keep those coming. We didn't get to every one of them tonight, but uh, keep them coming. And don't forget, you can always find us on our website. We'll see you next week.